Uh, good evening everybody. It's 6 30 and I'll start the meeting. For the benefit of the members of the public attending, I would like to explain who everybody is around this table. My name is Councillor Anne Court and I'm the chairman of this committee. Down the sides of the table, to the left and right, are councillors who sit on this committee and who will be making the decisions on the applications this evening. Immediately to my left and right are the officers who would be advising the councillors. Now normally, and I can't see if there are any, but uh, no. <laughs> well, if there were any councillors that uh, not on the committee but have asked to present their views, they'd normally sit along by the windows. Yes, right. <laughs> the exception to the rule. <laughs> Welcome, Cathy. In addition, I would like to explain that the Development Committee is a regulatory committee and not a political meeting. The committee will be looking at the evidence brought before us tonight and will make a decision based on planning reasons. We are guided by national and local planning guidance and policy. I understand that planning can be emotive and ask that everyone remains polite and professional throughout the evening. May I ask all speakers, which includes visiting members, to speak clearly and to return to the audience once their presentation is complete. No further dialogue between members of the committee and speakers will be permitted once questioning has finished. May I also ask all committee members to avoid repetition and to keep any comments on each item to a maximum of four minutes. So now move to the formal agenda. Uh, item one is to note that the open proceedings of this meeting are being webcast on the internet. Item two, to receive apologies for absence. I have received apologies from Councillor Barnes and Councillor Leakes. I've ha not been notified of any resignations or replacements. Councillor Watts? Um, I think uh, more than a week ago, the officers were advised that I will be replacing Councillor Hussey. <coughs> No, okay. It's okay. noted. Item four, any declarations of interest? No. Item five, urgent items and announcements. I have none. Item six, to confirm the minutes of the last meeting held on 18th of August and 2nd of September. Everybody happy? Agreed? Thank you. Uh, item 7 and 8, referrals from other committees or the Council, or issues referred by the Cabinet, I have none. We move on to item number 9, applications for planning permission and public participation. We move on to item number 1, 46 Lordsfield Gardens. And we have objectors Mr Thompson and Mrs Driver if they'd like to come forward please whilst the officer introduces the application okay the proposal is the erection of a part first floor part two story side extension further to the members site visit there's no further update and the recommendation stands to refuse the application thank you you have up to four minutes between you I shall put the light on when the amber light comes on you've got three minutes left What you've got one well the amber light comes on at three minutes, which means you've got one minute left. All right, you ready? Okay, um I'm Carol Driver. Um thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. I have uh, objected in writing, but I wanted to come along and just sort of summarise what my concerns were. Mine is the house at the back on that drawing. Um, three things really. First of all, I think the extension is going to be very close. It's going to be right up the board of my garden, which my garden is quite small. So it'll be right up against the property. Um, it's going to affect the light. My garden is south facing and this house will be, I think, blocking that light, especially when the sun is lower in the autumn and winter time. I think it will make the garden darker and the back of the house darker. Um, and mainly as well, I think the appearance, it's going to be a solid, unbroken brick wall. It's two storeys high, plus the roof space, and there'll be no windows and also no planting because, again, it's right up to the border, so there's no way to sort of pretty it up. So I think it's going to be very imposing. I think it will make my garden feel a bit like a cave, <laughs> and um, I just feel it's too large. 
those are my reasons. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm David Thompson from number 47. Um, obviously I've objected in writing, but the reasons being the proposed extension would leave us at number 47, living in a virtual goldfish bowl. Our small garden would be totally overlooked. We would feel um, the same, like even standing in our kitchen, the window would be would look straight into our um, kitchen. Um, the building would cut out all morning sunshine to the left L-shaped part of the of our garden there, and it wouldn't reappear until 1 a.m. So by bringing forward that building by the equivalent of the the width of their two garages, there would be no sun until it had passed round at about one o'clock. Um, it's no wonder that the architect of Lordsville Garden can choose to put left-hand or mirror-imaged houses on any of his plots. And he obviously chose that hand, otherwise you can imagine it would be the other end, the right-hand end of the building would be over on the left-hand side. If anyone's in doubt of our position, could you please come to our gardens rather than look at the two-dimensional plan? Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, members? Councillor. Okay. Just ask um, uh, Mrs. Driver. Which, sorry, which, could you clarify for me which house you were from? Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I saw another hand along here. Councillor Mr. Taylor. Uh, yes, just for clarity, you say um, that you live in number 47 and that there's a, there's a window overlooking your kitchen. I, which one is that? Could you put the microphone on? Sorry. Sorry, yeah. Our house is higher. The plans don't show that it isn't a flat site. There's a retaining wall at the bottom of our gardens. So our, um, when you're standing in our kitchen, which is then higher up again, we'd only be looking up at a slight angle into the bedroom window that would be just there. So you're talking about the window on the front, there isn't a window on the side, you're talking about the front window above the garage, okay. If there'd been a window on the side, I wouldn't see it until I went out into the garden. Yeah. My objection, like I say, on, on the last part of our L-shaped garden, the only place where you can do the wash, hang, hang the laundry out, is like I say, totally losing the light. It literally would be, well, just over an arm's length away. Okay, Mr. Bryan. Oh, right. Any other questions? No, thank you. Ask Debbie Dennison to come forward, please. And you also have up to four minutes. Hello, my name's Debbie Dennison. Um, my husband would have liked to have been here tonight as well, but unfortunately he's away at sea, which makes it slightly impossible. Um, we employed an experienced architect to ensure that we complied with planning requirements, obviously having no experience ourselves. When we became aware that there were concerns, we met with a planning officer to discuss them um, and consider the alternatives that he suggested. These included a single extension over the double garage or knocking down the double garage, building a single one and extending over. We offer compromises including further lowering of the roof height and utilising dormer windows so that we could maintain floor space. These weren't found to be acceptable and we felt that the alternatives the planning officer offered did not suit us either practically or aesthetically. We have undertaken extensive re research and provided photographic evidence to try and address the issues raised and also our neighbours' objections. 
A considerable number of properties have been extended on Lordsville Gardens, some less sympathetically than our proposal. I have also tried to make these photos available to councillors, but I gather this wasn't permitted. Um, our neighbours' objections predominantly concern loss of privacy, noise and disturbance, design and distance from the boundary. These issues have been considered in the planning officer's report and he concluded that the proposed extension would not unduly compromise existing neighbouring relationships in this regard. To reinforce this point, it should be noted that we are sighted down a fairly steep slope and currently it's our property that's overlooked by some of our neighbours. The extension we proposed has no view from the side that faces these neighbours, would have frosted windows at the rear and would overlook the neighbouring substation from the front and we have provided photographic evidence to demonstrate this point. The extension would border the end of the neighbouring gardens where there is also a path between their boundary and our house, so we are at some distance. And this boundary gap is consistent with other properties with two storeys adjacent to a garden. And we believe there should be no loss of privacy. I have discussed with our neighbour at number 48, our hedge that borders her garden. This is at the end of its life and we expect to replace it with a shorter screen, thereby opening up more of her garden. Our hedges are a vital screen in preventing us from being overlooked by all neighbouring properties, but hopefully this would be a positive step. No other neighbours, including those who face our property, have any objection to our plans and nor do the parish council. We need extra living space, especially as I work part-time from home. We also have to consider the needs of ageing parents and what we want to provide for our child. We don't want to move house because of the expense involved which would necessitate leaving the area. My father moved to the village to be near us. He is integral to our family and I don't want to move away from him. We're also very involved in the community. I work with a number of charities in the village and I'm a governor to the local primary school, all of which would be affected if we had to move. Also, if we were able to proceed with this extension, this would clearly benefit local traders at a time when the recession is having a significant impact. That's all I'd like to say, so thank you for taking time to consider the application. Thank you. Any questions, members? Councillor Mr Brown. Thank you. I, I, could you just tell me about the hedge, because it was such a huge hedge, and you've just mentioned it, so could you tell me what you are planning to take that hedge down, are you? Yes. <laughs> There's a large hedge at the rear of our property and a lesser length one at the side. So the one at the side is very clearly... It's past its best. So we would be taking that out and replacing it with something that's not as wide because we don't feel that we are badly overlooked in that corner. So it would open up a little bit of the um, space at the end of Mrs. Driver's garden. Okay. Um, would, would that affect... Can you put your microphone? Sorry, I thought I had, sorry. Would that, um, would that give more light to the one, the next one along? which is the L-shaped house, um, would, would that make, uh, can we see the other plane, the, the one with the, the ground, that's it, a uh, 47, would that give, no, no, it wouldn't make any difference, no, thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Tilbury. Um, uh, Mrs Dickinson, on the, um, what, the two um, objectors, obviously one of them complained about the large wall on the Senate, it's rather sort of, um, it's like the end of a wear road, which is you know, not unreasonable. Would you have any objection to putting a window over? Because I think the other ones would be more concerned that if you put a window in there, there'd be an overlook. There seems to be a bit of a conflict between the two residents there. I mean, is there a problem with putting a window in there? Bearing in mind, if, if we do, that, if Nordic they ask that, they ask for obscure glass in there, but it, it would break it up. Is that a problem? We've got no issue at all with putting a frosted window in there. The only reason there's no window in there is because we believed we were not meant to put a window in there. But if it would break the blandness of the view, that's not a problem to us. No further questions? Thank you. No more speakers. Local member, Councillor Tilbury. Oh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, first, I'd like to ask what happened to the photos that uh, Mrs. Denson, I think she gave them to sort of when we were on the site visit there. I mean, because normally we've allowed people to hand out the photos. She'd, I think she tried to email them to us, but they were sent in a form that I don't think anyone could read. I certainly could. I don't know if anyone else could. Uh, unfortunately, I think her husband's got the originals and he's away well, at sea or under the sea or somewhere. So. Chairman, when, when we have information submitted to, to, to members, which isn't part of the application, sorry, uh, by applicants, we normally 
as in this case, ask the applicant to give that information directly to members if they wish to do so. Um, that's a normal process with, with these things. It's unfair on third parties if additional information is submitted um, and not part of the application process itself. So um, I, it sounds like, unfortunately, that email didn't get through to some members, but uh, that's the applicant's responsibility or, or their agent's responsibility. No, I meant the on-site visit. I think she'd printed out the email so that the, or the, the photographs that were on the email so you could see the other extensions in the air. I wonder what had happened to those. As I say, Chairman, it's not for officers to hand out information via third parties. It's not fair so it, via the applicant or third parties. It's not fair on the other party if we're giving out information to members. So it's entirely down to the applicant to give that information out to, to members. It's their process. Yeah. Um, yeah, moving on to the, I think there, there's obviously a problem here. The neighbours obviously have got objections to the size and bulk of the extension there because of where they live, which is understandable. But, I mean, in principle, officers aren't saying you can't have an extension on that side. They're just saying it's sort of a bit too big. If they extend it out the back, it will have even more of an impact on the neighbours because it is facing east-west. So I think that they're losing more light that way. So that sort of would actually be worse in a way. It's almost better if they're in line with the existing properties. I mean, I think if we'd seen the photographs, or I think some of you were able, the ones who were on the site visit saw some of the other properties. And it is referred to in the officer's report, number 27 has an extension over a double garage, which is actually full height. It's not subservient at all. So the principle was set by this council back in 93. So and if you look at the officer's report, it clearly says, well, the objector's concerns about the impact on neighbouring immunity are not are not relevant, and you know, given the size, I mean, obviously they are to them. That's you know, but given given the distance to their properties and the the gap between there and the boundary with a wall, it's just not that's not an issue. The only thing that seems to be an issue with the officers is the bulk of this development and the size. So I've gone back to our. Our, our guidance we give people, which is what we give them on extending your home. And if you look at the examples in there, I mean, the first one I looked at on, on page one is about is about 81% of the size of the original building. And on, on the other ones there, they're sort of 66%. But well, I looked at the plans for this one. This is about 60%, I think, of the original building in terms of the frontage there. So, you know, if we're giving people this guidance and telling them this is what they should do, it's probably not a surprise that they do it. And we get, you know, architects look, have looked at this. This was uh, done by an architect, Lawrence Nardi, who's well known to this committee, and we had a very similar one the other week. It is difficult, to, I think, to extend these sorts of properties because they're these very long windows. It tends to make them look elongated, but I think that goes with the territory. I mean, it was, I think officers have suggested they sort of knock the garage down and make it a single garage, so it would be about four foot shorter. I mean, would that make any great difference? I, I don't really think it would they're still going to look rather elongated. I mean, so I, I'm sort of struggling to see what the problem is with this. If this was the first extension we were going to set a precedent, I'd maybe consider some doing something differently there. But I think that so many of these houses have been extended. Some have got dormers. Some have got set-down roofs. One of them is full right the way across, and is, is far bigger than this. So I can't, I, I can't see how we could turn this one down. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Mrs Tucker. Um... Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I actually don't like it, um, sadly. Um, I would actually like to move the refusal for the reasons given here. Um, I think it could be extended, but I think this is just too much. And I think it's also making smaller the garden, which is really quite small in the back, especially as it's, it's more of a bank rather than a sort of a flat, usable garden, um, which it, I mean, just go, goes with the plot. You can't change that particularly. Um, but that's how I feel. I'm afraid I don't. I I just think it's too much, and it's not subservient enough. Um, and I feel sorry that that their needs are such that they want one as big as this. Um, but that's the way I feel. Thank you. I've got Councillor Ratkin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, can I express my thanks to yourself for your kindness shown to me when I wasn't here on the 2nd of September by reading out uh, statements on the King's Clare applications. Um, firstly, the expense that somebody has and their role in the community is not a planning matter and uh, needs to be disregarded by the applicant in my, in my view. And in Councillor Tilbury's comment about 
something in 1993 being bad. Well, it's bad in 1993. It's still bad in 2010. No, no. I, well, just leave me to to take my view on it. Thanks, Ian. Um, it, my my main point is that the planning history on this, on page three of 54, said this application proposal does not attempt to alleviate the concerns raised in the previous application, which was withdrawn by the applicant. This is essentially identical to that. They had concerns about it then, the applicant. The, we as a council, our planning officers, had concerns then. And this does not uh, change, in my view, that, that opinion. There is a severe slope or in the garden on this, on this application. And as has been pointed out by Councillor Tucker, it will mean that uh, some of the garden, which is already lost to amenity space, will, be con will, will also um, be, a, be at a loss. The proposed first floor creates significant bulk um, to the dwelling and, and is unsympathetic in its relationship to the host and doesn't therefore meet E1 in its entirety. And and it is difficult when you need something for a family living to get it right. But this is wrong, and we shouldn't approve it. And I will second refusal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mrs. Bryan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just sorry that we didn't go into the garden of 47, 47, 48. But I would like to ask the officers, perhaps, if they could answer this question. The, the, the. Um, objector talked about losing light in that L-shaped um, house's garden. Has any, has any of the officers had a look at this and could, uh, could somebody comment on that for me? Because it would help me to make a decision. Okay, in terms of myself having personally been to the site, I haven't been to the site, but in terms of what the officers addressed in the report, there's, there's no loss of light objection in there, so on that basis I think there is no harm there, justifiable in planning terms. Looking, looking at the map and, and the way the sun is and how close that's going to be, I can't see how the, the cannot, the, how there isn't a loss of light, if that's, the, that's south isn't it, the, the south there's going to be that that piece of garden is going to be in constant shade. Why are you saying it's it's not that's not a problem? Of, I thought loss of light is something we could. Take. So I think this is um this is why I think site visits are so Im important both for office, you know, obviously officers and members. As the case officer would have visited the site and looked at the issues of the the fact that the house the two story house is currently there. The officer will be assessing what the impact is of the additional bulk of the extension. Yes, it's closer, but they'll also be assessing and looking at the distances, looking at the height levels and such like to assess whether that impact is actually significantly harm or harmful to warrant refusing on, on that particular issue. Their assessment here uh, focuses, they, the officer feels that the recommendation should be to refuse based on the design of the extension only and feels that in, in, in their view that the impact from a, a light or overbearing point of view is not sufficient to warrant refusal when it's on its own grounds. Obviously members can take a different view. Members can decide to refuse it on the basis of the reason recommended but also add a further reason if you felt there was issues of light or uh, an overbearing impact onto those particular properties. That's your, your decision and hopefully from your site visit you would have been able to form a view on that, on that basis. Right, it's been moved and seconded for refusal. All those in favour of refusal, please show. Those against refusal? I ask the officer please to confirm that decision. Chairman, just confirm the application has been refused and that's on the sole reason given in the order paper, which is the design of the extension itself. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. We move on to item two, which is Castle Transmission International, Cottington Hill, Hannington. I was proposing to move this from the chair. Do members wish to debate this one? I'll move it from the chair. And, and chair, as, as uh, 
board member, I'm happy to second that. Thank you. Right, it's moved and seconded for approval. All those in favour of approval, please show. Anybody against? No. Ask the officer to confirm that, please. The application has been recommended for approval. Right, we move on to item number three, Chapman's Ford Farmhouse. And we do have public speaking on this one. We have Alexandra King. Oh, right. I'll just ask the officer to introduce the application. Okay, the application is the change of use of agricultural land to residential use. Following the member's site visit, various points were, were sought for clarification from officers. The first one was the use of the triangle area of land to the north of the site, which as you can see from that plan, it's that triangular piece of land there. The clarification to the extent of the land within the residential curtilage at this present time. And the third point was why the application was not retrospective. With regard to the triangular area of land, the concern seemed to be arising from the presence of the caged soft fruit vegetable patch. Now, as officers understand it, following discussions with the, the applicant's agent, that cage has been present on the site there since about the 1970s. In any event, the, the use that, that is taking place there is, is more commonly considered to be an appropriate use of agricultural land, certainly of that scale. So in planning terms, that doesn't raise any concerns to officers. With regard to the extent of the land within the residential curtilage, as it stands at the moment, the application site and that triangular piece of land is entirely separate from the residential curtilage of Chapmansford Farmhouse. It's only land that is to the east of that existing hard line that's been pointed out to you there. In terms of why the application is not retrospective, it's understood that on the day of the member's site visit, residential paraphernalia was observed on the site. This is something that officers are aware of, and as we understand it, it's an intermittent usage that's undertaken by the present occupants of Chapmansford Farmhouse. That in itself, however, is not considered by officers to constitute the change of use, and on that basis, it's not a retrospective application. There has also been some discussion with regard to the engineering operation that may have taken place on the actual application site in terms of levelling the land. As it stands at this present time, and the, the information that's been provided to officers is that we believe that that operation took place back in 2006. So at this point in time, we don't have a definitive answer to say that, that there is no enforcement issue there, but as it stands, we're quite satisfied that no further investigation subject to the outcome of this application by members today needs to take place. Thank you. You have up to four minutes. Chairman, members, um, my name is Alexandra King of Southern Planning Practice and I represent the applicants, uh, Mr and Mrs Eakins. The applicants apologise that they cannot be here in person tonight. Um, the applicants purchased the property in 2006 from a developer who had achieved planning permission to convert the rest of the Chapman's Ford Farm complex into residential dwellings. The applicants are applying for a change of use from agricultural to residential land for a small area of field that is within their ownership. The site adjoins their walled garden. The applicant will um, regularise the ancillary residential use. The site is currently used on a casual basis for activities such as football for the sports mad children as the existing garden is not practical for such family activities. They plan to convert approximately 10% of the field into residential use. This would make more efficient use of, of land that has no meaningful or potential agricultural use. It is too small and inaccessible to be used efficiently. The change of use would have no sufficient impact on the landscape significant impact on the landscape or the wider character of the conservation area. The views of the site are restricted. It is well screened from the road. It is not visible from any other dwelling. As stated by the officer, no physical alterations are proposed. The related orchard planting would contribute to and enhance the character of the conservation area. There would be no vi visual impact, therefore the propose proposal would preserve the character of the conservation area. The Landscape and Conservation Officers refer to the farmstead setting and strong agricultural character as reasons for recommending refusal. However, these characteristics were lost when planning permission was granted in 2005 to convert the Chapmansford Farm complex. A precedent for such change of use in, sen in sensitive areas has already been set. Um, the authority have already allowed a change of use from agricultural to residential curtilage for another part of exactly the same field under the 2005 permission for the farm complex. The Council accepted that the change of use would not have an adverse impact upon the landscape or scenic quality of the countryside or AONB. 
Therefore, the Council should be pragmatic about the consequences of granting that planning permission. <laughs> On the one hand, the landscape officer is concerned about the, protecting the unsport, intimate character of the area, but on the other hand, the Council have recently granted permission to Vitacress. This has resulted in noise and disturbance from HGVs both day and night. In summary, the applicants feel that the, their application is appropriate considering the context of recent changes to the landscape character. It would have no impact on, in terms of visual amenity in accordance with local plan policy E6. It will enhance the conservation area through the associated orchard planting in accordance with local plan policy E3. It is a very, very minor development, just 10% of the existing field. It would not result in the loss of any productive agricultural land. It would not result in any demonstrable harm compared to the forthcoming major industrial development just up the road and would not generate any further traffic. They strongly urge the committee to be sympathetic to the application and to grant planning permission. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members, any questions? No, thank you. All right, Councillor Watts. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'd be interested to know if the Conservation and the Landscape Office revisited this site. Um, I would have expected the Conservation Office to note that the public passage he quotes from the Conservation Area appraisal is, is completely out of date. Uh, and the Landscape Officer, in his comments on the earlier withdrawn application, re referred to site photographs and aerial photographs rather than anything actually seen. This application is for change of use of a small plot of agricultural land and only for change of use. It's not about the change to the land form. <laughs> it applies to the site as it is now. Uh, the reference at the bottom of page 19 of the report to engineering work is not material to this application. Um, the conservation area appraisal refers to the historic farming traditions, um, but as the agent has said, you know, we discontinued about four years ago when the agricultural buildings were converted into dwellings. The former farmhouse is now a family house. The present owners have put a lot of effort into eliminating ragwort in the neighbouring paddock. When I first visited, a pony was grazing there, but I understand that was only a summer visitor. It's traditional for country houses to have recreation facilities, tennis or perhaps croquet. Um, the users here seem to go for larger balls um, uh, and one of them oval shapes, as far as I can see. Uh, the, the reason recommended for refusal says that change of use would, and I quote, would result in an undesirable suburban intrusion. I lived for my first 50 years in suburbs and uh, there's absolutely no danger of Chapman's Ford becoming suburban. Um, on page 17 of the report, the landscape officer quotes from the landscape character assessment, which I have here, um, <coughs> referring to, quote, some of the less accessible parts of the river valley. Now he's chosen the wrong bullet points. There's a dozen in the document. This site's bordered on the south by the C23 Haraway that leads to Walworth Road, and <coughs> reference to Vitacrest, you'll remember that was mentioned a couple of weeks ago. It carries all the vehicles carrying fresh produce into Vitacrest, scrap metal lorries, and many other vehicles. Um, <coughs> the site's about 100 yards from the crossroads with the B3048. It runs along the Bourne Valley from the A303 to the A343. This is not a, a less accessible road. There is a bullet point from the landscape character assessment that applies here. It describes hamlets developing along the lower valley sides of valley floor and main routes through the landscape running along the lower valley slopes and valley floor. And uh, this is now a residential hamlet, having previously been an agricultural area. Another <coughs> quote from the reason uh, that's given for refusal. The detriment of the visual immunity and scenic quality of the RONB. But if we go back to page 17 of the report, it says the proposal is unlikely to have significant and adverse impact on the visual amenity of the area. And lower down that page is three numbered paragraphs. The first is invalid because the area has already changed from agriculture to residential. The second mentions arbitrary boundaries and doesn't make any sense to me. And the third, as we've discussed, is not relevant to change of use. It's about landfall. So summarizing. It is a small part of a paddock attached to a large family house in a residential hamlet. Allowing this change of use will do no harm to the character of the countryside, uh, no character or the um, area of outstanding natural beauty, and no harm to the character of the conservation area. So please allow it. <coughs> Thank you. 
turn your light off. Any further speakers? Well, I'll move the recommendation from the chair. Councillor Mrs Tucker. You seconded it. It's moved and seconded for refusal. All those in favour of refusal, please show. The office to confirm that? The uh, recommendation to approve failed, right. and therefore we need to have a second vote. Right, we need a... It was uh, the vote was uh, five to six, um, and therefore fails, and and so we need a second vote. I propose um, uh, <coughs> that the application be granted on the grounds that it's a preserves the character of the conservation area and the ONB. Seconded. Well, it's moved and seconded for approval. All those in favour of approval? Those against? Ask the officer to confirm that decision, please. Chairman, just to confirm then the approval for that planning application, uh, with uh, members' approval, uh, I think probably there's one, uh, we're very clear from Councillor what's the uh, reason for approval. In terms of a condition, can I just suggest to members that we remove uh, permitted development rights from the, from the site so that there is control over that. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Right. Move on to item number four, Nothing Hill, King's Clear. And we have public speaking, Mr. Harford and Mr. Andy Partridge. Everyone's been very good in getting ahead of it tonight. <laughs> Ask the officer, please, to introduce the application. OK, the proposal is the demolition of the existing dwelling, the demolition of two existing garages and an outbuilding, and the hard standing of a tennis court, and its replacement with the erection of one number five-bed dwelling with a triple garage and associated hard and soft landscaping. Uh, further to the committee members' site visit, there is no further update and the officer recommendation to refuse stands. Right, you have up to four minutes. Good evening, my name is Mark Harford. Uh, my wife Louise, who's sitting behind me here, and I are the applicants. Um, I just briefly want to describe the consultation efforts that we've made over the past months and then Andy Partridge, our agent, will describe the proposal. Uh, we bought the site in, in May and have consulted as fully as possible before submitting our application. Um, initially, we spoke with all of our nearest neighbours uh, who were all uh, somewhere between a quarter of a mile and half a mile away in each direction, and all of them were happy with the proposal. Uh, we consulted the parish council, who subsequently confirmed uh, that they had no objections and they described it to us as a well-mannered and well-researched proposal. Um, we contacted our ward member, Councillor Osselton, to ensure that we complied fully with all of the requirements of the process. And uh, uh, finally, we had a preliminary consultation meeting in July with the case officer. Uh, in this meeting, the officer said that he had no comments on the design of the house. Uh, he said he agreed it had no visual impact on the surrounding area, but he did have some concerns over size and mass, but he gave no specific guidance as to why or by how much. Nonetheless, uh, in an attempt to acknowledge his comments, we adapted uh, from our ideal design, so we lowered the ridge height, uh, we additionally reduced the overall footprint area, and uh, we additionally reduced the total mass. Uh, all of these changes were reflected in the final application. The site has a unique setting. It's uh, set in a bowl in a former quarry uh, with an extensive framework of planting. It's a large site of 5.5 hectares, secluded and well hidden. In allowing a larger house previously on appeal, which was subsequently renewed under the current policy, the inspector commented that the site was exceptionally well screened and that a larger depth dwelling complemented its setting. The design takes its reference from this appeal one of the key features of the property is its pleasing long facade. The scheme replicates and extends the frontage by about three metres. It also incorporates the feature bay windows, which is a, a feature of this development. The previous pill allowed for an L-shaped building. The only difference is the L has been handed. This allows the bulk and mass of the development to be set behind the house, away from the road, 
and to put it in its context, the footprint only takes up 2% of the total site area. The design has been informed by other properties in the area. There are examples of similar scale Georgian houses in Kingsclear and around in the countryside. Indeed, the Foxes Lane approval was for a George's style, Georgian style development. Therefore, the design is not out of keeping with the area. As for landscaping, the proposal keeps its Dell-like qualities. It is proposed to intensify the planting with semi-mature trees to ensure that the development will not be seen. The officer refers to various appeals, but in all these cases, the sites are quite visible and therefore have a wider impact on the character of the area. In our case, there is an earlier appeal decision where there's an acceptance of a, that the site can accommodate a large dwelling because it's so large, being nearly six acres in total. Policy essentially seeks to protect the rural character of the area. Since it is hidden away, there's a previous acceptance of a larger house, and there are examples of other larger houses in the area, the scheme would not conflict with the policy aims. The proposal will contribute to a sense of local identity and is appropriate design and scale for its location. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, members? No, thank you. Oh, Councillor Tilbury. Can you put your lights on, please? Uh, the, the house that was allowed previously on appeal, how many bedrooms did that have? I've been looking at the, having looked at the site when we were there, I would guess that one was at least five bedrooms anyway. Right. I think it was four bedrooms. It was four, so. Mm. Right, thank you. Councillor Mrs. Osselton. You also have up to four minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Apologies for not being at the site meeting, but I did ask a member of the parish council to be rep representative. If I could start on Nothing Hill Gate with the area of outstanding natural beauty, which we know that this site lays adjacent to it. The AOB in Kingsclear is revered by its villagers, and I know it will be by the applicant and his wife who have um, dealings with the village. Under PPS 1, the pro proposed replacement dwelling is a sustainable de development. In the vicinity, we have a mixture of farms and private houses, some of which you can see and some of which you can't. Under PPS 7, the quality and wider countryside is protected and will be enhanced by this property. The natural rural environment is protected. We will have a replacement for a house that is um, not lived in, a little bit dilapidated, with a newer one with a family in. D6, this is a replacement dwelling, and we have already heard that a larger property would be appropriate given the extensive grounds. If we look at policies E1, E6, and the B and D local plan, etc., in summary, I would like to say that this replacement dwelling would, in fact, deliver a high-quality, efficient family home which reflects the design and proportions of development within the area, and which by reason of its design, positioning, which is in Adele, and the site's exceptionally well-screened landscape, such that it would be difficult to see a new or larger dwelling, would not adversely impact on the wider setting of the area. And having lived in Kingsclear and been the ward member now for 10 years, uh, that is um, certainly with this um, proposal, uh, it, is a, it is the right one to have, and that I ask, please ask that you approve this application. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Watts? Yes, I'm sorry. <coughs> I don't know this site, but um, there's a vivid description in the report. So if I could just read that and then ask you a question. It refers to um, minimal benefits brought by the removal of the existing dilapidated sheds, outbuildings, and the tennis court given their modest single-storey scale and size, overgrown character, and presently neutral impact within the site. Would you agree with the report the minimal benefit removing those? Can you put your speaker on, please? I think they the dwelling should be removed and the outbuildings removed, and as per planned from the architect, should be put into the area. So you think that will be an, import, uh, an improvement in the visual amenity? Everything that they plan to do for that house um, will be a, a benefit to the Kings, to Kingsclear and its residents, yes. Thank you. No further questions? Thank you. Councillor Rathke. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I, I'm delighted that you found it, is the, is the first thing. Um, there is no set style on Etchensville Road. There is variety of large houses. Uh, we know at the very bottom we have Fox's Farm has been, uh, we, we've gone to an approval on that. Um, this is a replacement dwelling. It doesn't, in my view, have any compromise of the wider countryside. Because of the size, scale of the plot, this is a sized and well-scaled house for that plot. It is a large house for a large plot, and that's what we should be seeing. We should see a mixture of developments within Basingstoke and Dean, and I think it, it matches the character of the area. This is what large plots were, were made for. They were for substantive family housing. It's a replacement of a unused and unloved dwelling. It's uh, an improvement in, in the fact that it's within a, uh, a dell, can't be seen, it's well screened and well hidden and is, in my, in my view, um, rewarding of the application, and I'll be moving approval. Um, Councillor Vaughan. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I think this is an excellent proposal. Um, I think uh, we should encourage the construction of handsome buildings such as this. Uh, I think the site lends itself perfectly to it. And as I said at the site visit, um, such is the shape of the land, you get Clarence House in there, and no one would be the wiser. Um, I think this is actually a perfect setting for a very attractive looking house, and I would second Councillor Ratican's movement. Councillor Mrs Taylor? Uh, uh, yes, I broadly want to agree with what's already been said. When we went to the viewing, it was one of the most secluded spots you could imagine for a house. Um, beautiful. I think to worry about the bulk and the increased footprint presupposes that the footprint of the original building was ideal, which I don't think it was. I do agree with the planning inspector who said that it needs a larger house. And I think we're sometimes frightened of imposing dwellings. And I think it would be lovely to have an imposing dwelling here. It will impinge on nothing. It's not visible from anywhere. And um, I would certainly be going for approval. Thank you. Councillor Mrs. Bray. Thank you, Chair. I thought this was a magical spot. I mean, it really was. I, 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 we walked in there and uh, we didn't know where we were going and suddenly we, c we came across this incredible site and this horrible, ugly building that's there and it's, it, at the moment. And I thought, this is, this is magic. They're going to actually do something really terrific and the plans are wonderful and I think the house is lovely and I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to vote for this. Right, it's been moved and seconded for approval. Yeah, the officers would just like to... Chairman, I'm sensing the mood of the, of the, the meeting. I, I think it's just worth reiterating from an officer's point of view, really, that we have, uh, on a fairly, you know, from time to time, applications to replace existing dwellings um, them, themselves, each one, where they are substantially bigger than what is currently on the site or currently what, what's approved on the site is having an impact onto the, the wider landscape um, of, our, of, 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 the, of the borough. Uh, and members have rightly looked at this individual site and rightly assessed it on, the, on those particular merits, which is, which is entirely right. I just wanted to emphasise this, this concern that, uh, again, this is another application where we are replacing, even as it is, a, a reasonably sized dwelling with a, a very, very substantive, uh, substantial dwelling. Um, and that over time, each application that is approved on that basis is having an impact onto the open countryside, and I'm just very, very mindful that we are, we are at risk of having a lot of these houses in the countryside, which to me detracts from that overall character and, and appearance. Councillor Tilbury. So in what Giorgio said, I mean, I would agree with that, and generally, I mean, I was half expecting to turn up and see a sort of the usual two bedroom cottage or a little farm workers bungalow to be knocked down and turned into some grand sort of thing like this. I haven't looked at the plans, but this isn't the case here. I think this is a site that you could live with a house like this. It, it works well here. Had this been on top of a hill or in the open countryside, I think I probably would vote against it. You know, it would be a complete change, but it is actually a very large house at the moment. And, you know, I think once you get to, you get reach a certain size with houses, that it becomes, they're not, 
you know, you've got to be quite rich to, to afford to, to even do them or even do that place up. They would cost a lot of money to renovate that existing building. And it's not of any architectural benefit because it's already been knocked around anyway. In fact, you could hardly see it anyway. And it is a very, you know, as we said, we were sort of like wandering off into the jungle almost. I <laughs> wonder if we were going to find the house. And the photograph doesn't do it justice there because you've got all that open space there, but you can't even see it from the road. And I think that's the difference with this site. It is, it's unique. It's not the usual, you know, replace someone's little bungalow with a great big mansion, it's, which we do get from time to time. Right, have we got some reasons for approval? Anybody want to help out? Councillor Raskin? My apologies, Chef. Um, it doesn't have a visual impact within, within the countryside. And as a replacement dwelling, uh, its size, bulk and scale are... are um, uh, are suitable for for this this site. You all right with that? Right. It's been moved and seconded for approval. All those in favour of approval. I think that's unanimous. Unanimous. I'll ask the officer just to confirm that decision. Yep. We can we can confirm that condition, but we would, however, say that we'd like to agree post the meeting with the chair conditions to be attached to the consent. Right, we move on to item number five, Oak Cottage, King's Clear. Um, I believe Councillor Mrs Osselton, if you'd like to come forward whilst the officer introduces the application. The proposal is a part first floor, part single storey extension. Further to members' site visit, there's one point of clarification in the office report in relation to the highway comment on provision of turning space within the site. It should actually read parking and turning to be provided within site if the application is positively determined. The officer's recommendation stands. Councillor Ms. Austin, you have up to four minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This property is situated, as you have seen for those of you that have actually been on the site visit, within a large plot with an unattractive brick extension to the side of the dwelling, which does detract from the main house. I disagree that the proposal will nearly double the size of the dwelling, having been there and had a look actually inside the house itself. Um, and the applicant, uh, who has an ill relative, does actually require the fifth bedroom with an ensuite. Under policy, E1, the depth, height and bulk of the proposed extension would not result in an extended dwelling, which would be disproportionate and would respect, and it would respect the character of the host dwelling. The proposal will improve, I feel, the attractive qualities of the local distinction by replacing the present extension, which I hope all of you will agree with me is of a poor design. It is mentioned the dormer windows, again at the rear, are not an incongruous feature and are built respectively into the roof and the privacy of the opposite neighbour in property remains sacrosanct. The provision of a part single storey, part single floor extended would improve the existing street scene. As you go along the A339, um, it, you, all you do see is this lovely house uh, with this carbuncle on the side. Um, and if you go to the back where the majority of the uh, building will be, uh, the cat roof, which w is, is being mentioned, the cat roof sits very nicely going down um, on the back there on the left hand side. The windows are into the back and as I've said before, the dormer windows sit very nicely in uh, to the side of that cat roof. Thank you. And I ask that you approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, members? No, no questions. Thank you. Councillor Rathgen. Thank you, Chair. Um, it is a notable house in my, in my view, and uh, unlike the last application, is visually prominent. Uh, the 339 uh, is a well-used road, and obviously um, what goes there needs to be needs to be right, it needs to be appropriate and needs to be in keeping with a, a, a house that has um, some architectural merits. And, and um, I, I think this, this application is a move in the right direction, whether through debate we can, we can uh, have it 
nailed out. I, I'm not yet sure. Uh, unfortunately, the the um, the uh, the dwelling does need repair, and the and the back of the dwelling is the is the area where I think most of the work needs to be needs to be uh, done. I'm I am uh, I do want extensions here, and I do want it to be improved. Whether through debate we can get that done, I don't know. I'll just leave out my comments there, and I'll leave myself open to uh, make a recommendation at a future time. Thank you. Uh, I drive past this building quite a lot, and every time I drive past it, I think I wish someone would ramp it up and make it look nicer and prettier. Um, on the site visit, I thought the, the current extension at the back is horrid. Um, how that got past, I can't think. I think the proposal, as it stands, is would actually make the building much more uniform, much squarer, and I think would add a great lease of life to what could and should be a handsome dwelling. Thank you. Thank you. Council Mrs Tucker. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I too um, live not that far away and go past this house and for many years have longed for somebody to take it into their heart and do something with it and I've been delighted to see a lot of improvements over the recent months etc. Um, when you look at it, and you can't see, tell from, from that picture that's up there, the actual house looks like the most wonderful kind of lodge-type effect, which is absolutely charming. Um, but what really concerns me with this proposal, as we have in front of us, it actually makes it sort of just go out into... It loses its character. It just goes into a... Into a um, Yes, you can't see. Where's the, where's the, there, the, the side elevation, which is a side, yes, the side elevation. Um, it, and, and it's not subservient in any way, shape or form. And, and I just think you lose the whole character of, of what is there. I'd love to see it extended and I understand they have needs. Um, and, and, I, and I would love to pass something, but I'm sorry, Madam Chairman, there's no way that I could um, move for the acceptance of this and therefore will move refusal. Any other further speakers? Councillor Mrs Taylor. Um, I think I'm going to disagree with Councillor Mrs Tucker. I, I, if, you <laughs> if you want to have something that's uh, completely in keeping with what's already there, you've got to create yet more mock Tudor I mean, it has a slightly ungenuine feel about it anyway to me because I suppose it's Victorian built on mock Tudor lines. Um, and I don't really think we want to replicate that. So I'd far rather have an extension that's slightly different, um, which will therefore make the original stand out more. And um, I'm pleased that the approach elevation hasn't changed. And I think what I've said many times before is that if we want people to take on these houses, improve them, and respect them and keep them for posterity, we've got to allow them to adapt them to modern day living. And um, so I, I think I would be in favour of this one. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded for approval. I thought it was, I thought approval was. Nobody actually moved approval. Right, it's been moved for refusal. Right, okay. No? Um, I'd share, I, I, I think that this is it's quite a, an unusual building and I think it uh, it does need a lot lot done to it. I would like to see the, the that ugly extension go because I think it's, it really detracts from this unusual building. I can't say that I really like this building, but I think it's so unusual that it should be protected and, and preserved. And and so I am I am going to vote, uh, I think I'm going to vote against what's been moved, which is refusal, isn't it? Yes? Thank you. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Thank you. It's been moved for refusal. Anybody seconding refusal? I, whilst you think about that, I think Georgia's going to come in. Ch 
Chairman, I just wanted to um, expand from the officer's report on the on this. I mean, I, I think most of us know this site very well from using the, the road on a regular basis and, and uh, have wanted to see improvements to this property for, for, for some number of years. To, to me, the, the, the principal concern is not about extending this, this property. I think we, we welcome improvements, welcome an extension to this property if it brings it back up into, into a state which we, we'd all like to see. It's just the, I think we, we, in approving the application, we may come to regret that in terms of its overall proportions. And it's not just looking at the side elevations, the overall scale and height and bulkiness of the extensions, but it's also the detailing, the fact that you've got what seems a quite an uncomfortable dormer window, that the openings in the ground floor don't seem to sit proportionally or respect the original um, wider windows in the original property itself. It, it, and then the cat slide roof on the back with a very big bulky dormer window again. It, everything about the extension, starting off from its overall bulk and size, seems to move away from and detract from the original property itself. And I, I'm, I'm just mindful if we members are to, to, to approve this, I think we, we may come to regret this when it's finally built. You may ask a question. Would it be possible to delay this and ask for... Um, some changes that, uh, instead of us refusing it, uh, that we could ask the, whether they might uh, accept some changes that the officers or and us could agree with. Uh, Chairman, I think the application before you this evening should be determined. It's certainly open to the applicant. If you are refusing the application, open to the applicant to come and seek advice from from planning subsequent to to, to that. But I'm, I'm sure for the sake of, of clarity and, and drawing a line under this application, a decision this evening would be helpful. Right, I believe it's only been moved for refusal. I'll second that refusal. We go to the vote. All those in favour of refusal? Those against? That's fallen, so all those all those in favour of approval, please show. Those against? I'll right, ask the officer to uh, confirm that decision. Okay, we can confirm that decision, but we would like to agree post this meeting conditions with the chair. Right, we move on to item number six, which is land at the junction of Sullivan Road and Brighton Way in Basingstoke. There are no public speaker or no, no public speaking on this one. I will draw members' attention to the update sheet. Um, I'm quite happy to move this one from the chair, but I have one quick question of the officer. Could we add an informative to add the contact details of the owner of the cabinets al along with their names onto there? Yes, we can do that. Bearing that in mind, I move that from the chair. All those in favour? Anybody against? Ask the officer to confirm that, please. Okay, no objections raised against this application. Right, move on to item number seven, Willow Brook, Sheffield on Loddon. And we have Mr. Walker, if you'd like to come forward, please, whilst the officer introduces the application. Thank you. Item number seven is for the erection of a first floor rear and side extension and the installation of a first floor window to the existing side elevation at Willow Brook Brown Road. Further to the member's site visit, the update reports that a letter of objection has been received from the neighbouring property to the south of the site called the Warren. The occupiers of this neighbouring property raised concerns that the proposed development would be imposing and would result in overlooking into their garden, allowing them no privacy. The occupiers of the neighbouring property feel that the bulk of the house is inappropriate and amongst this group of houses. Thank you. You have up to four minutes. Uh, Madam Chairman, Members, uh, good evening. My name is Simon Walker, uh, reference PDB 73009, which is um, Willowbrook, Bramley Road, Sheffield on Loddon. And the proposed erection of a first floor rear and side extension plus the installation of first floor window to the existing side elevation. Um, since originally submitting plans, we received no objections whatsoever from uh, neighbours. 
or indeed from the local parish council who um, approved our plans. Um, furthermore, given we are on the edge of a conservation area, I can confirm that the extension to the rear will be ver barely visible from the front of the property, nor will it in any way protrude beyond the line of our neighbour's properties at the rear. Um, in closing, with regards to the, uh, the matter of bulk and scale, which was the reason that uh, our planning proposal was initially uh, refused, I would just like to refer um, the property you mentioned earlier to the south of Willowbrook, which is known as the Warren, which did have, uh, some 10 months ago, a large extension to the rear. I'm estimating about 45 square metres. Uh, together with a second floor side window that directly overlooks uh, the entire property of, of Willowbrook. The, uh, all our privacy has, has gone. Um, <clears throat> the window installed uh, does contravene the approved plans and we have subsequently, just, just as an aside, lodged our concerns with, with the enforcement team, uh, which is behind perhaps why uh, they've responded in the way that they have. Um, at this juncture, um, that concludes everything that I would like to say. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I would ask that you uh, view our approval favourably. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, members? No? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, this part of Sherfield has absolutely no architectural merit whatsoever, as you might have seen on the, on the site visit. Um, I think Mr. Walker said most of it. Um, certainly from the road, those of you who came on the site visit, from the road you, could, you couldn't see anything as a proposal. Almost you couldn't from the flanks. Um, and I wouldn't put much credit on the late letter of objection. It actually says, raise concerns from the Warren, who have virtually blocked out all the light in from his garden anyway and there is his suspect window so i think that is a bit of tit for tat which really doesn't carry much weight but i would move this for approval thank you any other speakers you're seconding approval it's moved and seconded for approval move forward to a vote all those in favor of approval please show those against Ask the officer to confirm that decision, please. So, just before I confirm the condition, can I just um, ask members, um, if they are minded to approve, can I suggest recommendations of, of two conditions? One, to ensure that proposed windows at first floor level on the side elevations of the property are installed and maintained in obscure glazing and be top opening only. These windows currently serve bathrooms, or will serve bathrooms. Furthermore, I'd also like to recommend a condition restricting any new openings in the side elevations in the future to protect the level of private amenities currently enjoyed by the occupiers of the neighbouring properties. Everybody happy with those? Yep. Yeah. Great. Right. The application has been approved. Right. We now move on to item number eight, telecommunication station, Oak Ridge Towers, Basingstoke. Uh, we have no public speaking on this one, and I draw members' attention to the update sheet, and I'll move it from the chair. I'd second that as ward council, and often I get opportunity to move anything. <laughs> Moved and seconded for approval. All those in favour, please show. Anybody against? Ask the officer to confirm that, please. Sorry, yeah. Thank you. This application has been approved. Right, we now move on to paper C, which is the appeal decisions quarterly summary. I'll ask the officer to go through the paper. Thank you, Chairman. I thought there was uh, two cases I could bring to members' attention. The first one is on the top of page three, which is um, Loveridge Close in Basingstoke. And I think just ask Robert to put the plan on the, the screen and just focus on the, the area. Members will recall, uh, I think, discussing this application, which was for a new dwelling, uh, attached to the current dwelling at this site here in Basingstoke. An officer recommendation was to approve. Members overturned and refused the um, application. And indeed, that was dismissed um, on appeal. Um, Apologies for the quality of the print there, but it's the, um, uh, you can see the extension. It was one, again, I think, where members' site visit was very helpful in informing members to understand the relationship of the, um, 
of uh, the property within the street scene it, it itself. And certainly the inspector found that the, the uh, dwelling would be out of place and unduly prominent within that, uh, in that street scene. This, the second on the same page is Wheeler's Farmhouse at Turgis Green. And uh, just to take members through, this is a, a grade two listed building. Uh, it's actually visible from the, the, the main road that passes through the, the, the main uh, A road. Um, that's the extension that's been built on the site. You can see the original property. Uh, now that extension is not being built in accordance with the approved plans. Uh, I'll, perhaps Robert can put the approved plan on the, uh, on the screen to show you the differences. That's the approved plan. You can see how different that is. Uh, certainly officers, conservation and planning officers felt the uh, as built the extension was inappropriate, uh, unduly large uh, and dominant when compared to the listed building. Uh, and indeed the inspector confirmed that and uh, has uh, confirmed the enforcement notice which seeks the removal of this particular extension from the, the property. Um, that, uh, I understand that hasn't been removed as of yet, but uh, officers will be seeking compliance with that enforcement notice um, as soon as possible. Nothing further to add, Chairman, to the, to the report. Thank you. Thank you. And then we move on to paper D. I'll ask the officer to introduce the paper. Thank you, Chairman. In fact, there's nothing to add to, to, to this report. Thank you. Do the members have any comments to make? Councillor Hood. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think one of the successes for the planning department has been them able to give pre-application advice. Uh, I, like most other councillors, are frequently approached, approached by some of our residents who ask questions as how high can I build the brick wall, do I require a permission for a veranda, all sorts of things. So I always encourage them to ring the officers. I think that if they ring the officers and ask a simple question like that is, would I have to apply for planning permission? I don't think there should be any charge in that because that just to me is just purely a courtesy thing. I think if it's a full-blown application, then I think the charges should be in place. And I would support any charges in that area as long as we allowed people on a simple telephone call was allowed a free advice. I think that's one of the strengths which I think the department has been doing over the many, many years now. Councillor Rathgen. Thank you very much, Chair. I, I, I hate to disagree with uh, Councillor Hood, but uh, uh, this is the introduction of a charge for providing pre-application advice. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think most of us realise when you're giving advice, you, you, you are going to a professional, an expert, and, and in my view, if that is the case, there should be a charge in, in for, uh, uh, enforced. I think it is right, as Councillor Hood indicates, that uh, when a, a duty officer is asked for a consultation or a comment or something, uh, I, I think that should be free and we should be able to help the people of Bayes and Dean come to better applications before they come before us. So I would like to see pre-application advice being charged, but the duty officer consultation remaining free and, uh, uh, and, and something that we can be proud of as a, moving our, our planning and, uh, structure forward. Councillor Mrs Taylor. Um, just one or two questions. Um, this is obviously going to raise the bar in a sense. I mean, at the moment, people can go and receive free advice. Um, and it's been excellent, obviously, but just occasionally you do get people who don't feel it's been excellent. And, um, but you can sympathise, but it doesn't really matter in a sense because it's, it's free advice and there's no obligation to give it. But once people start paying, obviously, they're going to expect a much better service and there'll be much more comeback. Um, so my question, first of all, is... Um, are you going to be able to cope with all that? You know, I mean, are you going to be able to give that better service that people are actually paying for? And secondly, um, what is the money, the revenue raised, actually going to be used for? Will it be to employ extra officers, or um, how will that be employed? Thank you. Uh, yes, the, the the first one. I mean, I think there's a recognition that if uh, somebody is now being charged for a service, then they they would expect a. Uh, 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 level of service which was higher than perhaps they had before. I mean, certainly, uh, my feeling with the current prep service is that we try and provide a, if you like, gold level service, uh, and w we let ourselves down on, on numerous occasions because of the the amount of work that's that's coming in. Um, and to be honest, the amount of time that we spend on cases where they are really just unconsidered and, and without thoughts. And to me, perhaps they are um, just 
using a free service um, without thinking about the implications from a time point of view, but we're obliged to respond to them. I think, I think albeit the, the, the advice is, um, or other authorities have introduced charging, is, it's uh, unclear. I think there is a strong chance that the number of pre-apps coming to us will be less. And I think when they are less, they will probably be more considered because there is a charge in, involved. They'll be more thoughtful. Uh, perhaps planning agents would take more time to look at planning policy and our guidance before submitting uh, information to us for advice. And because of that, I, I think there'll be more time to spend on those cases which are more important to, to, to us as a, as a borough council. So I, I, I fully accept that we, you know, we do need to raise the bar, and, and I hope that through this process we can spend time on quality submissions to us, and then we can respond in a, in a, in a, in a way that we'd always wanted to have done in, in terms of pre -app. In terms of the, the, the revenue, the um, general cost of the planning service is paid from the, the, the kind of corporate budgets that we have. Uh, for example, any planning fees, planning application fees, goes into a, a, the, the corporate budget. Um, it, it, in terms of charging, um, where we charge, for example, for Section 106 uh, agreements, that um, is a resource that goes into that corporate budget uh, as well in terms of that, that, that pool of, of money. It wouldn't come to planning as such, it would come into the council itself. But of course, in doing that, it supports the planning service uh, in terms of development control, planning development, but then it can e equally support other services that support us. Landscape, conservation, highways, all those services that give planning support, equally other services in the council such as environmental health and so on. So it's right that that money comes in and it serves the, 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 wider, the wider council um, finances. Any other comments? Yes? Could I just ask a question? The £45 spoken about here, is that the sort of average amount charged by local authorities who do charge for this facility? Uh, there's, a, there's a different range of uh, fees attached to um, different authorities. Um, some charge by, by the hour, for, for example, which I thought was very quite a complex way of managing this, this process and uncertain for the applicant because it could just you know, go up and up and up. Um, certainly, uh, this is pretty much exactly the same as, well, certainly very similar to Hart District Council, uh, who looked at 25% of the, of the planning application charge plus VAT. And that means a £45 charge for a, a house extension. Um, and certainly and then we've applied the same fee for a, a, a formal written response to the do I need planning permission letter as well. So um, lots of our work relates to small scale householder extensions, so that fee would apply there. Obviously, the bigger the scheme, the, the higher the fee that we would, um, we would impose. Councillor Tilbury. I mean, the, looking at the, the cost per dwelling, it's sort of based on 10 dwellings, to be uh, 10 times the cost of th um, one dwelling, 335. But I kind of notice, in general, if we get one dwelling, it's very often in someone's garden or it's on a road. So it's relatively straightforward. When you start putting 10 hours or more, it implies it's on a bigger site. And are, are we looking to have a sort of different cost and structure for, say, you know, 100 hours, to say, a, la a major debate, where there's, you start getting involved in all sorts of infrastructure, Section 106, and, you know, it becomes... It start, I mean, I can think of one obvious application in my ward that we've both been dealing with for eight years now, and I hate to think how much officers' time is spent on that, and obviously we didn't get a penny for it, did we? And I certainly didn't. <laughs> Yes, yeah, certainly. The way uh, the planning fee, th this is the planning application fee is structured, is that essentially the bigger uh, and more complex the scheme, the higher the planning fee itself. The fee that's suggested here for pre-apps would be 25% of that fee. So yes, there would be a fee, if it's just one dwelling, a fee of, as on page, page 9 of 12, that fee would be just over £100 for the pre-application advice. Whereas you can see the one below, if it's for 10 dwellings, the fee would be just over £1,000 in total. So yes, it is proportionate to the amount of work that we would put in uh, in terms of the advice that we, that we give. And obviously, the more complicated the application, the more likely there will be uh, infrastructure discussions, Section 106 discussions, um, and, and other such, such as issues. And, and in fact, more likely that we will be depending on advice from Marcus and colleague and, and other you know, uh, landscape, etc. Yeah. Councillor Mrs Taylor. Just one more question, a little bit of self-interest here. I'm just wondering how this might impinge on us as councillors, if we might get more queries coming through to us. I mean, I know in the past, um, if, if somebody's come through to me for advice, 
um, I've frequently gone straight to you or somebody, and you've been extremely good in your planning offices in, in dealing with it with me. And um, I, I'm just sort of a little bit worried that I'll be able to give a little bit of a diluted service to people and have to say to them, I'm sorry, you're going to have to pay to go to the professionals. Yes, certainly, as, as the report sets out, um, if, the, uh, if there's a request for information for a householder extension, then they can come in and see the duty officer and they can take that, that verbal advice with, with them. If I'm a customer and I want to seek advice as to whether I need permission, I might come into reception, I might actually phone up, as Councillor Hood has, has said, and what we would do if customers phone up is say, well, these are the general rules as to whether you need permission or not, but then we won't start looking at the planning history to see if there's any conditions or uh, certainly not writing to the applicant to confirm if permission is needed or not. So, the, so there will be a basic level of advice. That's a you know, direction advice. And what we will say is that um, on the, you, know, you need to kind of self-service, you need to you look on the website, you, can un you need to understand yourself if you need permission. And if you are uncertain, then you need to get that, you should get that in writing, but there is a reasonable fee for you to get that in writing from us. And it's that Written, the, the verbal side of the information, I think, we should continue to give free of charge, either in reception or over the phone. But it's, that, it's the, the research and the consideration and the writing um, that takes time and effort uh, and uh, it's quite costly to, to the council in terms of a resource. Um, but I appreciate it will become, uh, it will be a culture change for both officers and, and members that we won't be able to give that, ad that written advice without a fee being, being paid. Right, no further comments? No, thank you very much. And, uh, confirming the recommendation, we're right? confirming that recommendation. Yep. yep. Okay, lovely. Thank you all very much.